As the worldwide sporting boycott around South Africa tightened, the British Lions ignored all protests to take on the invincible Afrikaners in their apartheid homeland. We whites in this country have a right to maintain our white identity under all circumstances. It was to prove the most controversial tour in rugby history. Inside beautifully to Phil Bennett. Look at that acceleration. Bennett with Billy Steele. Bennett on his own. Bennett five yards short. He's going to score. Phil Bennett. The Labour government were vehemently opposed to the South African tour and appealed to the conscience of the rugby players and officials. Lions captain Willie John McBride also wanted the tour to proceed. I don't associate the political and the sport. I never have done. Uh, and let's be honest, my own beloved province of Ulster in 1974, when I left, was in turmoil with the Ulster workers' strike. So, you know, I wasn't going to have any influence in the political scene at home. I don't think I was going to have much political influence on what was happening in South Africa. Together in London, the players trained in secret as the pressure hit them directly. We were virtually under house arrest for three days. And I remember I was asked, would I accept a petition from a guy called Peter Hain uh, of the anti-apartheid movement? And I read it to the team. And I said, I'm going to South Africa. It'll be my last tour as a player. I have one objective, to win the series, to beat them in the four test games. And I said, it's nothing to do with politics, as far as I'm concerned, nothing. And I said, if anybody has any doubt in this room about going on this tour the door is open please leave now don't come to me in a week don't come to me tomorrow don't come to me in three weeks because you're no use to this team if you have the slightest doubt that you're certainly no use to me and i remember what seemed like minutes and i sat there and nobody moved and i said okay we now are on the road <laughs> At Jan Smuts, the long-awaited Lions arrive. And Dr. Danny Craven. The British Lions were welcomed like long-lost blood brothers by a nation desperate for international competition. And our Komala, bestuurder Alan Thomas, captain Willie John McBride, and the vernaamste rugby spelers uit Engeland, Scotland, Ireland, and Wallis. While previous Lion teams had flair, most had floundered in the face of traditional Afrikaner aggression. This time, things might be different. McBride was ready to fight far with fire. The Lions showed their mettle in the first major encounter of the tour against Eastern Province, who were led by Hannes Murray, the up-and-coming Springboks captain. Slattery tries to farm it back at the back of the line-out. Edwards, Bennett, Irvin racing up, but that's Billy Steele back inside to Irvin. At the first sign of trouble, Captain McBride was heard to shout the order 99, and the Lions waded into battle. It's the sort of thing that's been boiling up for most of this game. Mervyn Davies and Slattery try to se separate the two factions. Rumour has it that South African selectors had suggested to the Eastern Province players, uh, we'd like to see what they're made of. I think they soon found out. We felt that it was necessary to not be intimidated as previous teams had been over there. So. Uh, um, it seemed to work, uh, but the ends doesn't always justify the means. <laughs> Windsor waits to throw. Mervyn Davis palms at the back, Utley on the peel. Made the ball available well. Gordon Brown carrying it on. Into the Eastern Province 25. Edwards, Bennett, just stood still and let the opposition come past him. Switch his direction. Andy Irvin in the line. Fed out to Roy Bergers. Billy Steele cutting inside. Great movement by the Lions. We had to take the law into our own hands. We had to show the opposition that they couldn't punch us and kick us and hack us at any time they wanted, because and they were, they were allowed to do it. So we had to have this unity, so that on the call, on the nod, or if one of us get into trouble, everyone would get stuck in, and it sorted the trouble out. For the first test at Newlands, it became clear that sport and politics were inextricably linked in the eyes of South Africa's second-class citizens. The referee for this first test match, Mr Max Bays of Western Province, as the Lions in the person of Phil Bennett kick off. He kicked off. They were playing with the wind. 
And I remember the Springboks actually took the lead. Good ball for the Springboks. Snayman. He drops a goal and it's over. I'll never forget the reaction of the team because to be 3 0 down wasn't what we had come for. And it literally lifted everybody. The Lions with the first three man line out of the game. Long to Slattery at the back. The whistle goes and Snayman offside at that line out. Max Bay's just making it clear to Hannes Murray, who doesn't like the decision. And Phil Bennett has a relatively easy chance to square the score. 34 minutes gone of the first half. And Phil Bennett from the better side is around the corner kicker. Bennett has got it. He puts his hands to his head. It was close, but it was good enough. And the Lions are all square. The Newlands crowd really tense. Are they going to witness a Lions victory for the first time here since 1938? Edwards looks for the long drop at goal. He struck it beautifully and it sails through. JPR Williams raises his arms in triumph. One minute of injury time now gone. And the whistle goes. The Lions leap in the air. Their joy unbounded, and rightly so. Their first win over South Africa in a test match here since 1938. Yeah, I think obviously getting a win in, at Cape Town was, was vital because I don't... I, I still think South Africa probably did expect to beat the Lions. But, I mean, we'd gone unbeaten up to that point and we, we had played well. We knew it was going to be a different ball game. But I think the fact that we got so much control in the muddy conditions and... I mean, really, we just, we just defended very well. Will you go as he go? And will I go? One of the things that we loved to do was sing. Sing in the bus, sing. No matter where we go, we used to sing in the bus to the game. It was, it was unbelievable. And Billy Steele was our choir master. In the second test, I remember we got on the, on the bus and, and we went a bit of the way and somebody said, OK, Billy, let's have it. And I remember Billy started singing the rouser, the rousing song. And, and that really is where the, the, the flower of Scotland came to prominence. And we were only halfway through the song when we got to the stadium. And of course the bus stopped and the doors opened and there was hundreds of people all there waiting for us. And nobody moved a muscle. We all sat there and sang right to the end of that song. Do you know if he had actually taken everyone out of that bus and taken us to Vietnam, we could have sorted out everything that was going on out there. That, the togetherness was incredible. But there was, no, there, was, there was no attempt from anyone to stand up. And when we got off that bus and into that dressing room, we knew something special was going to happen that day. Edwards. Rolling for JJ Williams into the 25. It, Williams kicks it on. This could be a try. Williams has scored. Ian McCallum chasing his own kick. Chipping through again. The crowd roar. Phil Bennett in his own 25. Running out of defence. Great turn of speed and a jink inside. Bennett to McBride, to Mervyn Davies. To McBride again. To Gordon Brown. Gareth Edwards to Roger Utley, but Utley just knocking the ball forward, but the referee says play on. JJ Williams, where's he come from? Williams a yard to go, and he scored! What an incredible try for the Lions! By half-time, the Lions were leading 10-3, and despite Bosch's kick, the South Africans were becoming increasingly frustrated at the prospect of another defeat. Gosh. Ten points to six. Two minutes gone of the second half. A long throw over the back. Fed on to Jackie Snayman. Snayman inside to McDonald. Comes back on the line side to Slattery. Slattery with men outside him. Inside beautifully to Phil Bennett. Look at that acceleration. Bennett with Billy Steele. Bennett on his own. Bennett five yards short. He's going to score. Phil Bennett, what a solo effort, what a dramatic try for Phil Bennett, he'll never score better than that. Mm. 
and there it is a one minute early the whistle goes but really it makes no difference as the Lions win 28 points to nine and beat South Africa so completely that the crowd here is stunned. By now the Lions were feeling invincible. Taking time out to go on safari before the third test, their superior collective spirit and team unity were seriously antagonizing the beleaguered South Africans. Of course, we kept on, and we'd all been pressurized by the dirt trackers for test places. They kept winning in midweek as well, and uh, beating Transvaal and Northern Transvaal and uh, Orange Free State. So it, it was competition, and the scrimmaging in training was harder than the scrimmaging in the, uh, in, in the actual games. It was, it was, it was fierce. You know, people like Sandy Carmichael couldn't get into the test side. Ken Kennedy, these were established Lions. Now they were fighting uh, Mike Burton, Chris Rawlson. Uh, Atlee, Tommy David, Neary, these boys were household names in the 70s and you know, they couldn't get in that test side. So um, it kept us on the toes and uh, we didn't make any changes for that side because uh, the, the first 15 were playing well and there was no need to make changes, even though we were pressurised. But we wanted to finish off the job and uh, we knew to win the series 3 0 was everything as we wanted. So it was down to Port Elizabeth on the ground level, on the sea level, a bit more grass on the field so we could play a bit more rugby. And the usual story, the first half hour, just uh, the usual battle, everyone in there, 99s, and uh, again, no step backwards, and again they lost the battle. The 13th of July 1974, will this be a red letter day in British rugby history? In the first 20 minutes of that game, the physical commitment of the Springboks was just, just immense, and I would say that's the hardest 20 minutes of rugby I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, and all credit to the Springboks, but also all credit to the Lions because we stuck it out, defended extremely well, and then the turning point was the uh, was there was hell of a puncher. And again, these unpleasant scenes breaking out, both sides piling in, and some of the most appalling scenes one can ever have witnessed in a rugby test match it the fists break out and really this is a giant free-for-all fitting more for the boxing ring well i think uh, there'd always been an attitude from the spring box that the british lions had had talented sides previously but that perhaps when the going got tough a few of them would Pretty commas a bottle out. And I think that message came over fairly strongly to them that this Lions side was a bit different and they weren't going to be intimidated. There's been a lot made of the, the 99 call. And I remember saying to the referee, you know, it, look, if you don't sort Only this out, short, we'll sort buried, it out. The fist break out. And I'll never forget it because he sort of shrugged his shoulders and just got on with the game. And I thought, well, I'm not having this. And that's when I, I called the players in and I said, right guys, when I call 99, we sort this out together, all of us. <laughs> there were a few guys, there was one or two of them a bit hesitant. But you know, we had no more trouble. There wasn't, I can't remember anyone shouting 99. As, as one of those Lions, Bobby Windsor used to say, he thought that 99 was a, was a cornet with a, <laughs> with a chocolate in it. Well, I, I think it's a lot of old bull, to be honest with you. I think the opposition are more worried about the call 99. If anything comes our way, it's got to go back with knobs on them. What is actually going to happen to them? I'm pretty glad it's not in use today because I don't think I could do something like that. <laughs> Scott Gibbs might like it, might. <laughs> JPR used to drive me nuts because he'd love to come from full-back and take me through ever a skirmish or fight he wanted to come back. JP was running in from full-back to join him because he liked a bit of the old physical stuff. The ball buried, the fist break out. The third test, Willie John called it once, and Gareth uh, Edwards and Phil Bennett and I were going that way, only to see JPR passing us at great knots going this way. Yes, it's all rather embarrassing now, it's about 25 years later. And if we call a line-out signal, and he, he sh was that a 99? Oh, no, John, it's okay, it's only a line-out. Sprinting 40 yards from the back to punch one of the, one of the big springbok forwards. And really, this is a giant free-for-all, fitting more for the boxing ring. We only did this once or twice. And the sort of news travelled, and you said, you know, don't mess around with these guys, because they're not going to take it. 
And uh, when I look back now, it maybe wasn't very pretty, but it sorted out a lot of problems that the referee wasn't sorting out. So, uh, but there's been a lot made of it. As I say, we didn't use it any more than two or three times in 22 games. So, <laughs> and you know, when you look back to 74, we scored more points, more tries than any other Lions side. Farm by Brown, Edwards just eluding Ellis. McGeekin to Milliken, out to JJ Williams. Williams showing a, a good turn of speed. Flicks it back inside to JPR. Five yards short to JJ Williams again. He's going to score under the post. JJ Williams, the Lions leap in the air. A magnificent try. Less than four minutes to go in this third test match. The Lions almost home in this historic victory. JPR Williams. Running out of defence, feeds Dick Milliken. He's got JJ Williams. JJ Williams chipping through. Runs past Chris Pope. It's a race for the line. Will he get the bounce and the pick up? He's got it. JJ Williams has done it again. And that's it. The Lions leap in the air. They've done it. And there, the man that's led them, the Lions, to this first series win in South Africa since 1896. Superb rugby, possibly the best rugby any Lions side has played under that sort of pressure. And we won this uh, match 26-9 and uh, it was fabulous rugby. And that, I think, was the peak of British rugby. 71 to New Zealand and after a third test in Port Elizabeth, when we came off that field, we, had, we were the outright world champions of British Lions of uh, 74 and 71. The fourth test, you know, it, 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 the fourth test, the last test, is always the difficult one. Uh, and there's so much expected of us now. And it was even more difficult in 74 for the simple reason that we'd won the three. We'd done it. The only thing for us was to be unbeaten. That's all we had to reach. So it was going to be a tough day. They had made a few changes. Uh, and... You know, it was again in Johannesburg. All the shoot, the end of the tour. There's 15 guys have finished. Uh, it's tough, and the 15 guys still have to play a test match. So it was going to be a tough day, and we didn't play as well as we played in the other test. Uh, and then we had that disputed try. Uh, it's still talked about. 13 points, all the score. Edwards to Bennett, to McGeekin, to Milliken. JPR Williams in the line. Williams still going. Williams cutting his way through. Five yards short to Slattery. Slattery could score. Slattery must be there. They wait the decision of the referee. Slattery surely was over. They can't believe it. I can't believe it. I think the referee would done a couple of test matches and they've been very, very good. I think he thought, well, I've got to live in South Africa when these buggers have gone home, you know. So he, th he thought, I'll call this a draw and everybody will be happy. And he sort of blew the whistle immediately after, uh, you know, seconds later. But I w w was convinced it was a try. The national outcry in Britain was overshadowed by the celebrations as the Lions returned home victorious. British Lions rugby tourists return home to a big welcome after their triumphant tour of South Africa. Thousands of supporters turned up to welcome the victorious Lions home, with the anti-apartheid protesters still ranged against them. But this time, government ministers had switched sides and were joining in the celebrations. It is a superb achievement these fellows have uh, uh, achieved, and I therefore thought it were right whatever my views on apartheid and how to deal with it, that I should acknowledge the superb sporting achievements of the British Lions. All those politicians who didn't want to know us at the beginning of the tour, uh, for all kinds of reasons, were now clamouring to be a part of the party on our return. But for their efforts in South Africa, the BBC Team Award this year goes to these British Lions.
The Wooden Spoon Society was formed, funny enough, in 1983 when England won the Wooden Spoon, and there was a number of gentlemen who had been over supporting that, and, and they said, let's make something off this, and there's a huge wooden spoon. And I happened to be on the aeroplane that day when they were flying back to London. And they formed the Wooden Spoon Society, which is a, a marvellous society, the rugby That's charity, uh, which has raised millions of pounds for deprived and handicapped children all over the four countries. And uh, it has developed magnificently. But they're running our reunion under, under the recall of 99, and we're going to have a dinner in Edinburgh, one in Dublin, one in Cardiff, and one in London. And the proceeds of that will go to the Wooden Spoon Society. It's, it's tremendous. And, and of course, for me, and be captain of the team and all of us to be together again and to have that opportunity, it's, it's terrific. I'm thrilled to be here. It's a wonderful occasion and I owe it entirely to the Wooden Spoon Society for this occasion and as patron I'm delighted to be part of that and to welcome you all here but most particularly of course our Lions of 74 who I think are possibly enjoying this evening as well. I think you can, you can tell by the response here in Murrayfield to this evening's occasion and the re reception you will get in Dublin and in Cardiff and in London that people have very special memories about the Lions 74 side and its success and that is obvious from meeting you as a team that that was a very special atmosphere in that team that allowed those successes to happen and it's a pleasure to have been part of the excuse to recreate that atmosphere and I hope you, it is something that the team members will enjoy because I am perfectly certain that everybody who will take part in those events alongside with you will enjoy themselves enormously and really appreciate the opportunity to celebrate with you. Uh, okay, a little passage of time, little changes here and there, but otherwise very fresh memories of a really extraordinary event. Added to which, you have been hugely flattered, I think, by the presence of some of your firmest friends who have come from South Africa to share these occasions with you. And that speaks volumes. I was given a description of um, the Call 99. Um, I'm not sure that it's necessary for me to touch upon that because I'm sure that all your speakers tonight uh, we'll have a much better story to tell on that particular uh, um, call. However, I do think that actually calling this event uh, Recall 99 was a pretty good idea. <laughs> but please don't do it here. <laughs> <laughs> Royal Highness, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, could I uh, first of all say to you, ma'am, that uh, you're with a bunch of, uh, or a pride, of very old lions tonight, so there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> Some of us are in the process of being rebuilt, <laughs> and most of us really haven't got our teeth anymore, so there's nothing, really isn't. And if there is a 99, I'm sure it'll be an ice cream later on. That's about it. <laughs> you know, there was a bond. I don't know why. There was a bond in 1974 because they were all great men. And there was a bond in 1974 in our team. Maybe it was because we won, but I believe it was because they were special people. And that bond hasn't waned in any one way for 25 years and I'm sure that it will never waver for another 25 years and for me it's special to have all these guys together again. <laughs> well there were so many different characters you know I, I, I've talked about we were winners but there, there were such great characters and you know I think it's Fergus Slattery sitting here beside me. 
I'd been in 71 with Slattery. Fergus had two tours in 1974. He toured with us, and then he toured with himself. All, <laughs> all at the same time. <laughs> Martin Fergus, it was a remarkable performance. <laughs> I don't know how you look so well. <laughs> and Mickey Burton. I didn't know Mickey Burton, really, until 1974. And you know, I was watching, there's a program on television, I'm sure you all watch it, called Watchdog. <laughs> Did you see Mickey Burton on Watchdog just recently? What a performance, Mickey. It was brilliant. It's the only time that I have seen Anne Robinson give up and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. Only Mickey Burton could do that. Bobby Windsor. My God, there's so many stories about Bobby Windsor. But the one that springs to mind, I'll never forget, was when we were having our last scrummaging session before the third test, down at Port Elizabeth. And we went out, and we had picked the same eight forwards again, and you had eight guys who were very annoyed they weren't in the test team. And we got down to do our scrummaging, and we crashed into them, and the other eight guys pushed us backwards. And I remember breaking this up, and I was slightly annoyed, and I said, you know, it's us who's playing on Saturday, not them, we're the test side. I was maybe a bit more forceful than that. <laughs> and we came back and we crashed into these eight guys and we drove them back, and somebody slipped in their scrum, and they went down in a heap. And we stamped all over them just to show them we were the test side. <laughs> and that great man from Richmond, Chris Ralston, was lying in about four pieces. And Ken Kennedy, where is he? I never forget, was trying to put him together again. <coughs> and he pulled his leg round into a more normal position and Ralston is lying there and he's writhing and screaming at the top of his voice. He said, oh, he said, the pain is excruciating. <laughs> and Bobby Windsor is looking at him like this. <laughs> and Bobby's saying, oh, he said, it can't be too bad when he can think of a word like that. <laughs> Maybe the most pertinent thing about Lions Tours is that when you come back to play in this country, it's never quite the same. When you don't know your opposition, it's so much easier to build up a little bit of hate, a little bit of hoil, and get at them. But just imagine when you've been away for three and a half months, coming back, having to play against Bruni, having to play against Willie and what have you. And such was the occasion when at Lansdowne Road the following year, and I was captain of Wales, obviously Willie was captain of Ireland, and there was a particularly abrasive moment in the game when I could see three or four of my Welsh colleagues flat on the floor, <laughs> and the penalty went to Ireland. <laughs> I couldn't contain myself. And I went to Willie John McBride and I said, OK, McBride, I said, if that's the way you want it, that's the way you'll have it. He just looked at me. Thank God. <laughs> and I never thought any more about it. Anyway, after the match, we were having a beer. Well, with the pipe. Tell me, Gar, why are you actually threatening me out there this afternoon, he said. <laughs> It's occasions like that that really live with you forever. Yes, we can look up the record books for the score lines, but quite honestly, there is no doubt that to be part of this tour and in Willie John McBride again, he was a man of very few words, never w wasted his breath. His main line on tour was, lads, it's great to travel with you. And that certainly has been the case. Thank you. Back to 
Everybody has their own moment to the Torah, which is the divine point where you, you know you've won it. And we played the two tests, and we got to the third test, um, Fort Elizabeth. We played the first half of that game, and we were struggling. We were up against it. We were battling, trying to get through it, and it was absolutely 50-50. Just almost 30 seconds or so, when we lost it before half time, line up throw, right on the springbok line, springbok throw in. This is not weak. Springbok hooker. For those who don't know, I can tell you that he was built like a dry horse. He had the speed of a racehorse. But fortunately for us, he had the fucking brains of a driving horse. <laughs> Joy for us, of course, to reach it in 1974. 
but it was a very, very rare occurrence. Now then, Mervyn, part of the all conquering Welsh side, and then the fantastic tour of New Zealand with the 71 Lions, and then on to, to 74. Now, the two, the, two, the two tours, I mean, New Zealand and South Africa, what was the difference between the two countries then, Mervyn? <laughs> one was hard, one was easy, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think um, the forerunner of the 74 obviously had to be the, um, the 71 tour, and uh, there was a, a nucleus of Welsh players in that, in that side, and we. Um, we went there, and with, with little chance of success, in all honesty. It was a very, very hard physical tour. All, all provincial rugby in New Zealand was extremely hard. There were no easy games, and you're out there for three months. And a lot of the players on that 71 tour, the successful 71 tour, were actually also in the 74 side. And in South Africa, uh, life was a lot easier. The sun was shining like today. Uh, the grounds are hard. Uh, and the provincial rugby was a lot easier than... New Zealand was. Add that to the fact that I think we caught uh, South Africa with well, their pants down to a certain extent. They, they'd been in the wilderness to a certain extent for some time as, as apartheid and all that, so they hadn't played a lot of international rugby. So life was a lot easier. In fact, 1974 was the easiest tour I've ever been on. I do remember though that uh, every time the ball came into the back of the lions and, and I just quite gently put my arm on their shoulder and jumped and took the ball and no one did anything. It wasn't until the last test match the guy standing, whose name I can't remember, actually thumped me. <laughs> this is illegal. <laughs> and I was amazed. That's, that's, that's how easy surprised. it was, yes, you know. Yes, I mean, yes. I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm trying to overemphasize how easy yes. it was. It, it, that pack of forwards in 1974 was awesome. It was, without any shadow of doubt, the, the best pack of forwards I've ever played. But when you say you caught them cold, you see, I mean, they'd just come off a winning series against France. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were considered, of course, in their own homeland, of course, to be a very, very effective side. And yet, you did say you caught them cold, and yeah, I think so. Uh, I don't think they'd realised the advances that, uh, that the Northern Hemisphere sites have, have done in the last, since 1971 yes. Lions Tour. Um, certainly, as I said earlier, the nucleus of the 74 side came from the 71 side. They were already hardened battle scarred yes. individuals, if you like, and uh, I, uh, I think they certainly underestimated us. to the Lions, may I just read, just read a few paragraphs, a few paragraphs, a little short paragraphs from this wonderful brochure that's been made for us tonight uh, by the Women's Women's Society. It comes from our president, uh, Mr. Peter Scott, and he wrote, that, he wrote that all sports, and rugby is no exception, develop a folklore, myth, and memory, but these 74 Lions were larger and more successful than any myth, and the deeds could outlast the longest memory. Unvanquished in the heartland of rugby's most hostile environment, they emerged not only having beaten the mighty Springboks, but also having earned their respect, the true mark of champions. A remarkable team with a remarkable record, and now we remember them on this remarkable occasion. Wooden Spoon Society serves them and the wonderful memory of all they achieved. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1974 British Lions, led by the legendary captain, the legendary Willie John McBride, and the 1974 British Lions. Thank you very much indeed, Max. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a tough week. <laughs> this is our fourth day. We started off in Edinburgh, and we fought all the way through there to Dublin, and now at last we're in Wales. And if we get through tomorrow, then we were a bloody good side. <laughs> And by the way, we're in Wales, and can I congratulate you on beating England a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> but we're talking now about uh, 1974 tonight, and can I just say uh, 
it has been a great week and it's been there are times in life that are special and I'm sure that all of us certainly in the 74 Lions will look back on this week with great memories because you know where the hell is 25 years gone <sighs> mind you you wouldn't recognize some of us <laughs> and they're rebuilding a few of us <laughs> Sid Miller our coach he's got two new hips and uh, Chris Ralston he's got two new hips Sandy Carmichael's got three new hips <laughs> Two men used to bloody well annoy me and they still annoy me because of fitness. <coughs> One was J.P.R. Williams, who did so much training and he was always fit. And the other was Andy Ripley. And he totally confused me at times. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you understand him, Andy Ripley. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Space engineers, space cadets, and fellow sensation seekers. <laughs> Shumai. <laughs> In uh, the Chalky Male Choir, they came here to sing on Thursday night, it's Friday morning. There was <laughs> In 1871, the Reverend H. H. Ormond who was a referee at the first international rugby match ever between England and Scotland, which it breaks my heart to tell you the Scotland one. <laughs> he said, at the dinner afterwards, he made a speech and he said the objective of rugby football was to produce a race of robust young men with active habits and manly sympathies. <laughs> Looking around this room tonight, I think he'd be pretty happy with the result of what the game has produced. So what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, what I would like to do is I would like to give them a modern-day allegory that life is a conflict between the twin claims, the magician and the drag queen. <laughs> he said, no, what I want you to do... He said, what I want you to do is give them a poem either about Mo Molum or Tony Blair. <laughs> And it's called, um, it's just a bit of doggerel, really. It's, I know nothing about politics, but it's, um, it's for you, Willie, about Tony Blair, whatever he is. <laughs> and it's called Just Desserts. I forgot the first line. Uh, I'm a populist prime minister from a Scottish public school. I enjoy your adulation. So I've made Britannia cool. <laughs> this is dramatic tension, or I haven't forgotten it's dramatic tension. The People's Party, the People's Dome, the People's Lottery. I am the People's Laxative, that's why you all trust in me. I'm a third way politician. Hello, sponsor Wolf. I'm a third way politician and know how good I look. Not too difficult, really, when you compare me to Robin Cook. I'll spin the truth. I'll make sound bites, I'll give hopes to the hordes, I'll do just what you want me to. Welsh Assembly, Scottish Parliament, bomb the Serbs, and I'll scrap the House of Lords. <laughs> I'll be so sycophantic that in me you'll back your shirts, and then in about two and a half years' time, guys, you're all going to get your just desserts. <laughs> I will shut up because actually, follow me, I'm, I'm like, like Willie was first, wasn't he? And Willie is, uh, Willie is for, he's a legend for us, Willie. I mean, we, um, don't we care? We, I mean, especially, he's got an aura, Willie. I don't know what about it is, I'd love to embarrass you, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> He never picked me in three and a half months. I don't know what happened in that time. <laughs> hey, fellow dirt trackers, we were great. We? <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to take anything away from the Lions. They were a great side. Uh, they learned a lot, I think, and people after them also learned a lot from them. Their motivational talks. Uh, Willie John didn't mention it tonight, but they used phrases that were at that time not commonly used in motivational talks, you know, things like, uh, we don't keep prisoners. <laughs> Kill you before it touches you. Uh, that sort of thing. And, uh, and also, as far as the refereeing goes, I think they were way ahead of their time, that, that group. Uh, or right, let's first say about counter-attack. That's what we've been watching all evening, uh, counter-attacking. I think they perfected that. That's how they had the speed, 
they had the people to do it, and it, it, it was beautiful. I enjoyed it, really, I enjoyed that part. <laughs> uh, especially tackling foe from behind. But, uh, And then also on the refereeing part, uh, today, I don't know if you've listened to Super 12 Rugby on occasion broadcasting, the, the referee will say, no, 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 it's not, not this, come here, come here, bring it back, bring it back, bring it, put it in the ball, put, put it in the ball, give the ball, release the ball, release the ball. I mean, that's Gareth Edwards, 20 years ago. Uh, they're just copying him today. He, he, he perfected that. <laughs> Would you, without further ado, welcome some very, very special gentlemen, the Lions of 1974 and Willie John McBride, ladies and gentlemen. The most important asset a coach has is not his own ability, it's the people he has to work with, the quality of the team, and we had men of quality. At that time, uh, coaching which had started on these islands in the late 60s had given Carwin James in 71 and myself in 74 players who were better prepared. Also, the Welsh had produced a clutch of great players, world quality players. JPR removed himself from that. He said he was universe quality. <laughs> now, I know that is true because he's told me dozens of times. <laughs> but I was privileged to travel with this this, this bunch of men. And of course we had the odd relaxation, you had to have the odd relaxation. There were times when they did relax a little bit and a little gentle jog in the morning soon got them onto the rails again. Mr. Burton would remember that and Mr. Bennett and a few of the others, Mr. McKinney. I got them on the rails again but they were an easy bunch to deal with. We kept it, as I say, very simple. Uh, our game plan was simple, and if you know these fellows, you would have to be simple, you know, so they don't just don't <laughs> And so we won. Now, if you look at that South African team, that South African team beat France 2-0 in a test series that same year. And the next year, they beat New Zealand in a test series. So there were no pushovers. Hannes Murray was a great prop forward. Hannes Murray was a great springbok and became captain of the springboks. So that team was a very good side, and I'm sure that Hannes is here tonight, and Hannes is here tonight because we respect him, and we respect him as a player, and a man, and a captain, and the Springboks, because to beat the Springboks to us was the end, that was absolutely the end thing. And, and seeing that there'd been success in this uh, Free State match, that we won 7-9, remember the referee, he's a good, sound, honest uh, judge. Of he was a criminal. <laughs> I won't mention his name, but he looked and played like Adolf Hitler. And two years before, I'd had him for Northern Transvaal versus England, and he'd done us again. So when we got this fella, I knew there would be difficulty. And Edwards was running the game. And every time he blew the whistle, he'd give some excuse. We didn't know what was on. He said, uh, psh, put his hand, what is it? Foot up, looking sideways, breaking wind, any bloody thing. What do you, what do you? <laughs> At one stage under the post, he put, he, he was about to put the ball in, he said, not straight, Edward said, I still got a ball in my hands. <laughs> in the last minute of the game, J.J. Williams would tell you now, and Gareth, this was an amazing thing. The ball comes in, and they've got the, the, their front row, Andre Bespier, Martins the Rue, and um, Rompy Stonder. They look like they've been in the Third World War, the Second World War, and the Fifth World War as well. They call it. I thought, well, there's going to be a death here if we don't stop this in a minute. And he kept a big yellow clock at the end of the ground and it's just going on to the things. Bob, he sticks out the right foot and takes one against the head. Right on their lane, losing. Gareth picks it up, shoots towards the touchline, throws it under his shoulder. JJ catches it and scores under the post. Coming off the field now, Bobby, yeah, yeah, that, 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 marvellous, that, what did he say to you? 
Did you see that bloody foot? He said, I moved there, there, bloke. That one three best beard, he said, never moved his bloody foot when I took that one, he said. Can't sit there, you daft bastard. I had my hand over his eyes. <laughs> we had two men in charge of the tour, Willie John from Balamina and Sid Miller from Balamina. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, men, rise as one, go to our first training session, go there. And we all left, oh, so motivated. And we're going through the door, and the great man shouts to me, Phil, can I have a word with you? He'd call me for a bit of advice, and I'm going back through the crowd of players. And Gareth Edwards had gone brown, didn't like it very much, because they said, you're scraping bastard. They didn't like it very much. <laughs> <clears throat> and Willie John sitting down there, and he says to me, ladies and gentlemen, my children's life, he says, Phil, do you remember that game we played in Cardiff last year? I said, what game was that, Willie? He said, the game, the Barbarians against the All Blacks, 19th, I'm chuffed, I played well, and I said, Willie, I remember very well. He said, do you remember when you got that ball in front of your own post? I said, Willie, I remember very well. Do you remember we did all those side steps? I said, Willie, I remember very well. Well, I'm telling you one thing now, any of that shit in this toy room with the first plane is on me. <laughs> we stayed in this place in Stillfontein, as I said, you're very bleak, and we did train there for 10 days, and the great Sid Miller, himself three Lions tours, the great man Willie John, they reckon the only way to beat South Africa, these giant Africana prop forwards, second rows, 20-odd stone guys, was to scrummage, scrummage, and scrummage. So as we left that first session, I can always remember Sid Miller saying, Gareth, to the great Gareth Edwards, you take the backs and go off and do your training. We'll go off and scrummage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what Sid didn't know, nor will he, Gareth Edwards, was the laziest, worst trainer that God ever put on this world. <laughs> Do you know, I've never enjoyed training so much in my life for 10 days in Stillfontein. <laughs> Gareth set us mammoth tasks, snooker, <laughs> cricket, five-a-side cricket, touch rugby, soccer, and then the ultimate test, hide-and-seek. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I would go and watch the donkeys train, the forwards. And no machine against eight in those days, like today. Eight against eight. Carmichael against Burton, butting each other. Mighty Mouse against Fran Cotton, kicking each other. Bobby Windsor trying to bite Ken Kennedy's ear off. And I said, look at these, and they go down in the scrum, bang. And Sid would say, get up, not good enough. Splitting their heads and their ears. Next scrum, bang, down again, and Willie John said, not tighten up, up again. And I said, look at them, I said, thank you, stupid bastards. <laughs> I was just proud, delighted to be here this evening, part of a wonderful cause for the Wooden Spoon. I hope you make lots of money. For us lads, just to rem have some yarns, have a great time, to be very proud of being British. And I'll just finish by saying one controversial, perhaps, thing. There's a guy, I think his name is Proby in the summer, who says the Lions shouldn't tour, maybe every eight years. Ladies and gentlemen, keep the Lions alive. It's the greatest thing in the world. Thank you very much. After 20 minutes of absolute mayhem, Willie John stopped the game and he called over the referee and he said to him, either you sort it out or we will. <laughs> so Willie John McBride called all the forwards round about him. Plus JPR. <laughs> and that's when he uttered his most famous statement of all time, and it's why we're here tonight. He said, when I shout 99, you hit the nearest <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was aghast. I come from Trun. <laughs> He's going to shout a number and I have to start hitting people. <laughs> people I don't even know. <laughs> and it was only four minutes later, we're in a tight scrum. And as we healed the ball clear and Gareth went scampering off down the blind side. My captain shouted 99. And I remember thinking, I don't believe this. <laughs> You're supposed to be the creme de la creme. We shouldn't be doing this. 
But at the same time, my arm slipped off of Willie John's back, <laughs> through to their front row to the tight head prop. <laughs> and unfortunately for him, one of the other boys hit him as well. <laughs> And it was a terribly one-sided punch-up. <laughs> well, they didn't know about 99, did they? Can you imagine what it was like for them? What was that number? <laughs> but of course, that sorted out all the stupidity. And of course, we now know that in history, the only other time the big man called it on the field was in that third test match. And when he called that Magic 99, we shouted, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like just to finish by telling you that thanks to my mum and dad, I've got two brothers that walk this planet whom I love dearly. Thanks to rugby, and in particular my British Lions touring days, but even more so my 74 tour. Thanks to rugby, I've got another 35 guys as close to me as my brothers. And you know, Willie John McBride was a great man. A great, he still is a great man. <laughs> and I'll never forget, before the third test match in Port Elizabeth, that all-important test match, and he turned to me and he said to me, Brownie, tonight, he said, you must be able to look me straight in the eye. And that night, after our victory, in the wee small hours, I went up to Willie John, and I said to him, Willie, can I look you straight in the eye? He said, Brownie, for the rest of your life. Farm by Brown. Edwards just eluding Ellis. McGeegan to Milliken. Out to JJ Williams. Williams showing a, a good turn of speed. Flicks it back inside to JPR. Five yards short to JJ Williams again. He's going to score under the post. JJ Williams. The Lions leap in the air. A magnificent try. I think that uh, the Lions are winning 74 must have been pretty special I think because they only drew their last game and uh, other than that I think that uh, they must have had a magnificent squad and the, the friendship and together and that's must have been quite special as well for them to go all the way and uh, achieve something that no other side has ever done. They, they set a, a standard that we've probably all, certainly in 1980 we kept referring back to and, and it's wrong to copy but you always had them in the back of your mind that you'd love to think you were a part of a team that could have uh, done what they, what they achieved because after being there you know how difficult it is, and there's, there's, there's no doubt they hammered them. And some of the rugby played was, was magnificent, and to go unbeaten, you know, and then be robbed of, of a whitewash, you know, in the, in the final, you know, final test. Um, it was full of everything, drama, you know, great rugby, uh, but to go out there and, and, and beat the South Africans, you know, uh, magnificent in the way they accomplished it as well. Everything was stacked against them to go the whole way through, uh, not just win the series, but to, you know, to go unbeaten through South Africa is just uh, something that will never ever be matched, I don't think, by, by New Zealand, by Australia, let alone the Lions. Um, it's going to be a, a mighty side from anywhere in the world that does as well as the 74 Lions. It was nice for me to finish on those two tours and say, right, with, with effort, with planning, uh, and approach and preparation, we can be as good as the Southern Hemisphere. Less than four minutes to go in this third test match. The Lions almost home in this historic victory. JPR Williams running out of defense, feeds Dick Milligan. He's got JJ Williams. JJ Williams chipping through, runs past Chris Pope. It's a race for the line. Will he get the bounce and the pick-up? He's got it! JJ Williams has done it again. And that's it. The Lions leap in the air. They've done it. And there, the man that's led them, the Lions, to this first series win in South Africa since 1896.